That very month was September, and as fine as you could ask. A day or two later, a rumor, probably started by the knowledgeable Sam, was spread about that there were going to be fireworks. Fireworks, what is more, such as had not been seen in the Shire for nigh on a century. Not indeed since the old Duke died. Days passed, and the day drew nearer. An odd-looking wagon, laden with odd-looking packages, rolled into Hobbiton one evening and toiled up the hill to Bag End. The startled hobbits peered out of lamplit doors to gape at it. It was driven by outlandish folk, singing strange songs. Dwarves with long beards and deep hoods. A few of them remained at Bag End. At the end of the second week in September, a cart came in through Bywater from the direction of the Brandywine Bridge in broad daylight. An old man was driving it all alone. He wore a tall, pointed blue hat, a long grey cloak, and a silver scarf. He had a long white beard and bushy eyebrows that stuck out beyond the brim of his hat. Small hobbit children ran after the cart all through Hobbiton and right up the hill. It had a cargo of fireworks, as they rightly guessed. At Bilbo's front door, the old man began to unload. There were great bundles of fireworks of all sorts and shapes, each labeled with a large red Fionorian G and the elf rune G. That was Gandalf's mark, of course, and the old man was Gandalf the wizard whose fame in the Shire was due mainly to his skill with fires, smokes, and lights. His real business was far more difficult and dangerous, but the Shire folk knew nothing about it. To them, he was just one of the attractions at the party, hence the excitement of the Hobbit children. G for grand, they shouted, and the old man smiled. They knew him by sight, though he only appeared in Hobbiton occasionally and never stopped long. But neither they nor any but the oldest of their elders had seen one of his firework displays. They now belonged to the legendary past. When the old man, helped by Bilbo and some dwarves, had finished unloading, Bilbo gave a few pennies away, but not a single squib or cracker was forthcoming, to the disappointment of the onlookers. Run away now, said Gandalf, or you will get plenty when the time comes. Then he disappeared inside with Bilbo, and the door was shut. The young hobbits stared at the door in vain for a while, and then made off, feeling that the day of the party would never come. Inside Bag End, Bilbo and Gandalf were sitting at the open window of a small room looking out west onto the garden. The late afternoon was bright and peaceful. The flowers glowed red and golden, Snapdragons and sunflowers and asturtiums trailing all over the turf walls and peeping in at the round windows. <laughs> How bright your garden looks, said Gandalf. Yes, said Bilbo. I'm very fond indeed of it, and of all the dear old Shire. But I think I need a holiday. You mean to go on with your plan then? I do. I made up my mind months ago, and, and I haven't changed it. Very well. It is no good saying any more. Stick to your plan. Your whole plan, mind. And I hope it will turn out for the best. For you, and for all of us. I hope so. <laughs> anyway, I mean to enjoy myself on Thursday, and have my little joke. Who will laugh, I wonder? said Gandalf, shaking his head. <clears throat> we shall see, said Bilbo. The next day, more carts rolled up the hill. And still more carts. There might have been some grumbling about dealing locally, but that very week, orders began to pour out of Bag End for every kind of provision, commodity, or luxury that could be obtained in Hobbiton or Bywater or anywhere in the neighborhood. People became enthusiastic, and they began to tick off the days on the calendar, and they watched eagerly for the postman, hoping for invitations. Before long, the invitations began pouring out, and the Hobbiton post office was blocked, and the Bywater post office was snowed under and voluntary assistant postmen were called for. There was a constant stream of them going up the hill, carrying hundreds of polite variations on, thank you, I shall certainly come. A notice appeared on the gate at Bag End. 
No admittance except on party business. Even those who had, or pretended to have party business, were seldom allowed inside. Bilbo was busy, writing invitations, ticking off answers, packing up presents and making some private preparations of his own. From the time of Gandalf's arrival, he remained hidden from view. One morning, the hobbits woke to find the large field south of Bilbo's front door covered with ropes and poles for tents and pavilions. A special entrance was cut into the bank leading to the road, and wide steps and a large white gate were built there. The three hobbit families of Bagshot Row adjoining the field were intensely interested and generally envied. Old Gaffer Gamgee stopped even pretending to work in his garden. The tents began to go up. There was a specially large pavilion, so big that the tree that grew in the field was right inside it and stood proudly near one end, at the head of the chief table. Lanterns were hung on all its branches. More promising still, to the hobbit's mind, an enormous open-air kitchen was erected in the north corner of the field. A draft of cooks from every inn and eating house for miles around arrived to supplement the dwarves and other odd folk that were quartered at Bag End. Excitement rose to its height. Then the weather clouded over. That was on Wednesday, the eve of the party. Anxiety was intense. Then Thursday, September the 22nd, actually dawned. The sun got up, the clouds vanished, flags were unfurled, and the fun began. Bilbo Baggins called it a party, but it was really a variety of entertainments rolled into one. Practically everybody living near was invited. A very few were overlooked by accident, but as they turned up all the same, that did not matter. Many people from other parts of the Shire were also asked, and there were even a few from outside the borders. Bilbo met the guests and additions at the new White Gate in person. He gave away presents to all and sundry. The latter were those who went out again by a back way and came in again by the gate. Hobbits give presents to other people on their own birthdays. Not very expensive ones as a rule, and not so lavishly as on this occasion. But it was not a bad system. Actually, in Hobbiton and Bywater, every day in the year, it was somebody's birthday, so that every hobbit in those parts had a fair chance of at least one present at least once a week. But they never got tired of them. On this occasion, the presents were unusually good. The hobbit children were so excited that for a while they almost forgot about eating. There were toys the like of which they had never seen before, all beautiful, and some obviously magical. Many of them had indeed been ordered a year before, and had come all the way from the mountain and from Dale, and were of real dwarf make. When every guest had been welcomed and was finally inside the gate, there were songs, dances, music, games, and of course, food and drink. There were three official meals, lunch, tea, and dinner, or supper. But lunch and tea were marked chiefly by the fact that at those times all the guests were sitting down and eating together. At other times, there were merely lots of people eating and drinking, continuously from 11 seas until 6.30, when the fireworks started. The fireworks were by Gandalf. They were not only brought by him, but designed and made by him. And the special effects, set pieces and flights of rockets were let off by him. But there was also a generous distribution of squibs, crackers, backer wrappers, sparklers, torches, dwarf candles, elf fountains, goblin barkers, and thunderclaps. They were all superb. The art of Gandalf improved with age. There were rockets like a flight of scintillating birds singing with sweet voices. There were green trees with trunks of dark smoke. Their leaves opened like a whole spring unfolding in a moment, and their shining branches dropped glowing flowers down upon the astonished hobbits, disappearing with a sweet scent just before they touched their upturned faces. There were fountains of butterflies that flew, glittering into the trees. There were pillars of colored fires that rose and turned into eagles, or sailing ships, or a phalanx of flying swans. There was a red thunderstorm and a shower of yellow rain. 
There was a forest of silver spears that sprang suddenly into the air with a yell like an embattled army, and came down again into the water with a hiss like a hundred hot snakes. And there was also one last surprise. In honor of Bilbo, and it startled the hobbits exceedingly, as Gandalf intended. The lights went out. A great smoke went up. It shaped itself like a mount seen in the distance, and began to glow at the summit. It spouted green and scarlet flames. Out flew a red golden dragon, not life-size, but terribly lifelike. Fire came from its jaws. Its eyes glared down. There was a roar, and he whizzed three times over the heads of the crowd. They all ducked, and many fell flat on their faces. The dragon passed like an express train, turned a somersault, and burst over by water with a deafening explosion. That is the signal for supper, said Bilbo. The pain and alarm vanished at once, and the prostrate hobbits leapt to their feet. There was a splendid supper for everyone. For everyone, that is, except those invited to the special family dinner party. This was held in the great pavilion with the tree. The invitations were limited to twelve dozen, a number also called by the hobbits one gross, though the word was not considered proper to use of people. And the guests were selected from all the families to which Bilbo and Frodo were related. With the addition of a few special unrelated friends, such as Gandalf. Many young hobbits were included, and present by parental permission. Four hobbits were easy going with their children in the matter of sitting up late, especially when there was a chance of getting them a free meal. Bringing up young hobbits took a lot of provender. There were many bagginses and boffins, and also many tooks and brandy bucks. There were various grubs, relations of Bilbo Baggins' grandmother, and various chubs, connections of his took grandfather, and a selection of burroses, bulges, brace girdles, brockhouses, good bodies, horn blowers, and proudfoots. Some of these were only very distantly connected with Bilbo, and some of them had hardly ever been in Hobbiton before, as they lived in remote corners of the Shire. The Sackville Bagginses were not forgotten. Otho and his wife Lobelia were present. They disliked Bilbo and detested Frodo, but so magnificent was the invitation card written with golden ink that they had felt it was impossible to refuse. Besides, their cousin, Bilbo, had been specializing in food for many years, and his table had a high reputation. All the 144 guests expected a pleasant feast, though they rather dreaded the after-dinner speech of their host, an inevitable item. He was liable to drag in bits of what he called poetry, and sometimes after a glass or two would allude to the absurd adventures of his mysterious journey. The guests were not disappointed. They had a very pleasant feast. In fact, an engrossing entertainment. Rich, abundant, varied, and prolonged. The purchase of provisions fell almost to nothing throughout the district in the ensuing weeks. But as Bilbo's catering had depleted the stocks of most stores, sellers, and warehouses for miles around, that did not matter much. <laughs>